This week sees the anniversary of Operation Dynamo, the miracle of Dunkirk, the moment when we snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. But while we rightly celebrate the immense rescue of over 330,000 soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk, what about the 70,000 people we left behind? The ones we couldn't evacuate. They have many interesting stories, a few of which I'm going to share with you today. And for all the people who escaped at Dunkirk, I want to start by sparing a thought for a group of people who not only didn't escape, but also were selected to not escape. And those were the men forming the perimeter lines. These are all around the Dunkirk perimeter. The object being to try and hold the German advance to get as many people away as possible. It's valiant work. These divisions included some of our finest regiments and they were slated to hold the line until they couldn't fight any more and then surrender to the advancing German forces and as a result they could expect honourable treatment as per the Geneva Convention. In many cases however this was not what happened at all. On the 27th of May 1940, the first day the evacuation began, the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Norfolks was holding the perimeter of the village of Le Paradis when the advancing SS Totenkopf, or Death Head, division attacked at dawn. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Norfolks put up a stubborn defence before falling back to their HQ and despite the lack of support and their lack of numbers and their ever dwindling stocks of ammunition, the Norfolks did, as ordered, fight to the end. They actually surrendered at 5.15pm, nearly 12 hours after first contact with the enemy. By that time it was when they'd run out of ammunition. It turned out to be the worst decision they ever made. Around 90 of them were marched to a brick farm building and when they saw the two machine guns pointing towards them, they knew how this was going to turn out. There was nowhere to escape to now. As the bullets died down, anyone still alive heard the unmistakable sounds of pistols being cocked and bayonets being fixed. Since the SS were going to commit a war crime, they were going to be thorough about it. As the cries and screams died down, a total of 97 men had been killed and French civilians were then forced to bury the bodies. In amongst those bodies were Privates Albert Pooley and Bill O'Callaghan, who were somehow still alive, despite both of them having been shot. As night fell, they found the space and strength to slip away from the scene. They then hid themselves in a pigsty, living off raw potatoes and puddle water. They lived like this for three days before being discovered and cared for by the farm owner and her son. At great risk to themselves, they nursed both soldiers back to a semblance of health. And they agreed to surrender to soldiers of the Wehrmacht, this time accorded the proper treatment as prisoners of war. They were treated in a military hospital and then spent the rest of the war as prisoners in Stalag 21D and later Stalag 8B. And we will return to their story later. Also holding the line were 100 men of the Warwickshire Regiment, Cheshire Regiment, Royal Artillery and some French soldiers. And they were holding the southbound road through the village of Wormhole. And like the Norfolks we've discussed before, they fought on until their ammunition was exhausted and then in line with the general orders of Lord Gort, they surrendered. After their surrender, they were marched to a barn in the neighbouring village of La Plaine Bois. Having rounded them all into the barn, troopers of the Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler then threw stick grenades into the crowded barn. And this would have killed everybody in there were it not for the sacrifice of Sergeant Moore and CSM Jennings, who jumped onto the grenades to suppress their explosions. Now, realising that their first plan hadn't worked, the Germans then brought groups out five at a time and shot them in the back, but this was taking just too long. So they resumed the throwing of their remaining grenades into the barn. A total of 80 men were killed immediately and a further nine died of their wounds within two days. But beyond all comprehension, despite numerous wounds, Five men survived the massacre and were discovered at the barn by the next division of soldiers to occupy the farm. They were privates Albert Evans, Edward Daly and Arthur Johnson. Lieutenant Kenneth Keynes and Gunnar Brian Fahey, they all survived. 
They were treated by Wehrmacht medics and joined their comrades in the prisoner of war camps. For them, their war was over, but they were damn lucky to be alive. Now, in amongst all the soldiers we needed to evacuate, there was an awful lot of British women serving in France at the time as nurses, drivers, mechanics, couriers and telephonists. But with the troops at Dunkirk now encircled, there was no way to evacuate them from there. Now, one of these trying to find her way out was Queen Alexandra nursing sister Lillian Gutteridge, and she was making her way to Dunkirk when an SS officer stopped her ambulance and attempted to commandeer it. When he ordered the ambulance be emptied and the wounded men be thrown outside, Lillian slapped him in the face with all the passion a British nurse can deliver. And that hurts. And in response, he stabbed her in the leg with his dagger. As he was about to finish the job, several soldiers of the Black Watch appeared and put the man out of Lillian's misery. Permanently. Then, with Dunkirk already fallen and with a wounded leg, she got back in her ambulance and drove to a railway siding. At that siding, she convinced the train driver to take her and her wounded onto the train and she escaped the Dunkirk area to Cherbourg by rail. But she collected a further 600 British and French wounded men on the way. And she and the men were evacuated from Cherbourg as part of Operation Ariel, which was evacuating as many personnel as possible from any port that the Royal Navy could still access. And it was one of those ports to which 20-year-old rifleman Bill Lacey of the Gloucestershire Regiment was now trying to make his way to. Bill had given up his seat in one of the boats out of Dunkirk so that a wounded man could take the place. And when he turned to get the next boat out, he found to his horror that there wasn't a next boat out. And as he started to see the perimeter guards being rounded up and taken prisoner, he elected to take his chances and try his hand at escape and evade. He headed south. He got rid of his uniform, he hid his weapon, and he stole clothes from French washing lines in an effort to blend in more with the local population. This could, however, make things worse for him, because if he was captured out of uniform, he could be shot as a spy. He wouldn't have had a great spy. He didn't speak French and he'd never been to France and had no idea where to go. But living off scraps and stream water, he stayed on the run in hostile occupied France. He said afterwards, every time I saw the sun come up, I told myself I was winning. And he carried on winning for four whole months. By this time, the evacuations at every other French port were long, long gone. The last evacuation boat from anywhere in France left on the 25th of June 1940. It was now well into October. As he approached the coast, having inadvertently travelled in a giant circle, he found a fishing boat tied to a small pier. Now, as an Ilfrican man from Devon, Bill knew how to handle a boat, but he'd never done a channel crossing before. But how hard could it be? After dark, he slipped the moorings, aimed the boat at what he hoped was England in the darkness. Soon after dawn, he came ashore near Dover, a ragged figure weighing less than seven stone. The last man out of Dunkirk was home. Where he was immediately arrested and taken to an army barracks where intelligence officers just wouldn't believe his account. It was only when French newspapers confirmed the story of a British soldier on the run stealing clothes and the mysterious disappearance of a fishing boat that he was believed, considered not to be a German's plant, and then released. Bill Lacey did get his chance to go back into action as well. His survival skills got him a transfer into special operations. And he worked on a mission in the Channel Islands later in the war to capture a German general. He retired at the rank of sergeant in 1964 to become a postman. For most of the men left behind, the war, as the phrase goes, was over. And they spent their days as prisoners of war being released and repatriated once hostilities had ceased. Albert Pooley and Bill O'Callaghan gave evidence at the war crimes tribunals which led to SS commander Fritz Nochlein being convicted of war crimes for the Le Paradis massacre. He was hanged on the 28th of January 1949 in Hamlin. In 1947 the role of Wilhelm Munker and the Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler was investigated for war crimes but it proved impossible to build a sufficient case against any individual to mount a successful prosecution. After a further campaign in 1988 by Labour MP Jeff Rucker, a German prosecutor again closed the case due to insufficient evidence. Uh, 
Since everybody who is identifiable has since died, true justice will never be done for the wormhole massacre. Sometimes the bad guys just get away with it. So when you see the many celebrations of Dunkirk, the praising of the little ships and the breathtaking film, spare a thought please for the 70,000 those ships didn't rescue. The men and women who came home a completely different way. The men who only came back six years later and the men who just didn't come back at all. Thank you. Bye bye.